Good morning, Grace Church. It's awesome to see you. Let's stand together on this beautiful Sunday morning. And this first song is a newer song that we've been learning. It's a declaration out of Galatians 2 that I've been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives within me. It's a life defined by Jesus Christ. Let's sing this together. in our first service, and um, we didn't have one for our second, but I didn't want you to miss it. So let's check this out. So I want to get baptized um, because, you know, over the last couple years, I've really been internally kind of working on my relationship with with Jesus. Um, you know, a big thing for me coming from, you know, my 
my background was I never really knew what it meant to have like a personal relationship with Christ. Um, so for me, like, I've been trying to work on that a lot. And now I'm, I think I'm ready to really externally, you know, make that display that, you know, I, I have turned from, you know, my, my past ways and I'm ready to follow Christ and really have that relationship and develop and, and grow. And I want to grow in that relationship here at Grace. I, growing up, I felt like I needed to be perfect, you know, to be accepted by Christ, that I had to, you know, do all these things and, and follow these rules. You know, for me, it's more just trying to, you know, follow in his, his footsteps and, you know, be as Christ-like as I can, but knowing that I might fall, but that, you know, he's going to be there to catch me and that I'm going to be able to, um, you know, be saved you know, by having trust and faith in him. Good morning, everyone. Well, we're, we're here with Nick this morning. And so Nick, via video, you just shared your testimony. And so according to your testimony, do you commit to living for Jesus Christ all the days of your life from hereafter? Yes, I do. All right, so according to your confession, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. From death to life, let's stand together. And let's sing this. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry the kind of weight? It was my turn. To that man.
John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Amen. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. You're hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name.
Good morning, thanks for coming today. I wanna to welcome you to Grace. Uh, certainly a huge hello to everyone at the chapel, uh, Chaska, and everyone watching online today. We are in a, a teaching series, walking through the New Testament book of 2 Corinthians. So if you wanna go ahead and make your way to chapter two today, 2 Corinthians 2, we'll pick up in verse five. But today, listen, today I, I wanna to talk to you, I wanna to talk to you about how to respond to a person who has absolutely blown it in life. I mean like derailed, crash and burn, a, a person who has sinned in, in an egregious manner and then repented. So essentially, I, I want to answer this question. How should Christians respond to an individual who's taken responsibility for his sin and then circled back to the person of Jesus Christ. Now, now you, you might hear this and think, well, duh, man, that's like a no-brainer, right? Like, wouldn't we be warm and loving and gracious and kind and, and merciful and forgiving? Wouldn't we, like, welcome them back in with open arms? Like, that's the Christian thing to do, right? Well, the answer to that is, is a resounding yes, but unfortunately, the Christian community hasn't always been kind or good to those who have fallen into sin and then circled back and returned back to the person of Jesus Christ. Sometimes, sometimes we keep our foot down on the punishment pedal way too long. Like sometimes we freeze people out in a way where they no longer feel loved, valued, or cared for. Sometimes we withhold forgiveness instead of extending it. And because of the aforementioned realities that often exist within the church, Paul helps us to think clearly on this issue. How do we respond then to a person who's fallen into sin and then turned from that sin and is coming back to the person of Jesus Christ? So with that said, let's stand together and read. See what God has to say to us today. 2 Corinthians 2 verses 5 to 11. Paul writes, now if anyone has caused pain, he's caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ. Verse 11, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Now, there is a uh, kind of a ton of debate kind of swirling around amongst commentators as to who this person is in Verse five through 11. Some say it is the incestuous man from 1 Corinthians chapter five. Uh, others argue that it's, it's the person who tried to undermine Paul's apostolic authority, or it's the one who resisted Paul's teaching during his second visit to Corinth, thus creating that painful visit for Paul. But honestly, like no one really knows for sure who it is. And I really don't think in the grand scheme of things that it's that big of a deal, a big of a deal that we know who it is anyway. Like the focus here isn't on who committed the sin, but rather on the fallout of the sin and then the response to the sin. Because verse five says this man's sin had, had caused grief not only for Paul, but for the entire church in Corinth. Like this man's sin had created pain amongst the community of faith in Corinth. His sin, Paul says, literally affected everyone. And I just want you to know, like that's, that's like always true 
about sin. I think a lot of people believe like I can sin and my sin just affects me or it just impacts me. And I'm telling you that is not true at all. Your sin never just affects you. Your, your sin always affects more than, than just you. Sin always creates a ripple effect that, that touches other people's lives. Uh, sin's consequences, I would say it like this, sin's consequences splatter everywhere. Sin's consequences get on everyone's clothes, right? They, the, sin is never contained. The consequences are never contained like we think. Notwithstanding, in verse six, Paul said, the situation had changed. So church discipline had been applied by the majority of the church and the discipline had been effective. Like, like the man responded, the man like owned up to his sin and he turned from it. Now, if you're kind of newer to the church scene, you might ask like, number one, what is church discipline? And then number two, like why is church discipline important or necessary? So a simple definition of church discipline is this. It is a, uh, it is a corporate response to an individual's sin. It's like a corporate response where the church responds like together in response to an individual's sin. Now, now, why is it important? Like, why is church discipline important? Why is it, it necessary? Well, well, number one, like it helps hold everyone accountable. Like if you realize, hey man, I'm gonna get called out if I, if I fall out or fall into sin, that can be a good thing for us. Number two, it protects the reputation of the church. So we wanna be really, really different than the world. We don't wanna sin in the church like people sin in the world. There should be a holiness that characterizes who we are as God's people. So it protects the reputation of the church. Three, it actually pushes people towards godliness. So if, if I know in the back of my mind that, that church discipline like looms large on the horizon, it helps me to like keep it straight, right? To walk and follow Christ. It pushes me towards godliness. Number four, it deters people from ungodliness. Uh, number five, I would say this, it helps church unity. And so we're all kind of keeping each other in check together. Uh, it increases the gospel witness to the world. Uh, number seven, it, because scripture requires it, the Bible actually calls us to, to perform church discipline. And then number eight, I would say this, it's actually a sign of Christian maturity. And the truth is, the truth is, when discipline is, is applied, sometimes it works and other times people choose their sin over their church. But in this instance here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, it worked. And so Paul's like, like, hey guys, remember, this is what we wanted all along. Because the goal in doing church discipline isn't the punishment, it's the restoration. Yet apparently, according to verses seven and eight, there were some people within the church who were determined not to grant relief, not to grant forgiveness or comfort or restoration. They were, they were content on leaving the guy in the penalty box. But Paul insisted that they had to forgive and comfort the man. Why? Because the man had repented of his sin. Now, let me just say a quick word here. When I talk about repentance, I'm, I'm talking about changing. When I talk about repentance, I'm talking about you change the way you think, you change the way you feel, you change your direction in life. I am not talking about a flippant, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, can we just get past this? That is not repentance. So this man repented. One of the ways that you know you have genuinely repented of your sin is that you have a desire in your heart to fix what you've broken, amen? You have a desire in your heart to repair the damage. And so when you, you care so deeply about the person you've sinned against that you just want to make things right. And that's this man, this man repented of his sin. So Paul's like, we're gonna forgive this guy. We're gonna comfort this guy, man. Church discipline worked here. And then secondly, Paul says, we gotta forgive this guy and comfort this guy because he didn't want the man to be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. 
Did you see that? So literally, Paul begs them to forgive this man. Now, let me just say something really quick here. Sorrow, regarding sorrow, sorrow is actually a good response for someone to have because it shows that they care about and they understand the gravity of the sin they have committed. So sorrow, godly sorrow, should not be avoided because oftentimes it leads to repentance. So the Bible talks about the distinctions between like worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is like, ah, I'm sorry, I got caught, I got busted, it's gonna impact me negatively. Godly sorrow is like, no, nope, no, nope, I have sinned against God, I've sinned against my husband, my wife, my children, and I'm just gonna own that. No, no excuses, no blame shifting, no deflecting, it's just full on ownership of it and then turning from it. So sorrow is not a bad thing. But once repentance has occurred, I think a, a serious danger lurks for those who are not restored to good standing in the church. They run the risk of drowning in their sorrow. This kind of discouragement may, may actually lead the weakened believer into worse sin. It's kind of like kicking a man when he's down and as soon as he gets up, you just hold him back down and kick him all over again. And so verse eight, Paul's like, I'm, I'm pleading with you guys here. Like I am begging you guys to reaffirm your love for this man. Now just a quick aside here, verse nine kind of sets this whole section up. So in verse nine, Paul reminded the Corinthians that he was testing them. How was he testing them? Well, he was testing them to see if they would do the hard thing. What was the hard thing? Apply church discipline. That's a hard thing to do. He wanted to see whether they would be obedient, in his language here, obedient in everything, everything meaning church discipline. Because that's a really difficult thing to do. So even here at Grace, we have elders. When, when someone falls into sin, when it's brought to the attention of the elders, right? We, we try to get a group of people together to try to lovingly and graciously talk to that person with the goal, not of punishment, but with the goal of going, hey, you need to see your sin, see the weight of your sin, the impact of your sin. And then ultimately, we, we want that person to turn from their sin and be what? brought right back into fellowship within the church of Jesus Christ. Like that is always the goal, but it's really, really a hard thing to do. Like it's, in, it's an intense situation to go to someone and to like call out their stuff. Like no one's signing up for that, right? And so all the elders are like, oh, I gotta do it. You gotta, like, like no one's signing up to do it. Like there's no joy in doing it other than on the backside of it if someone turns. And so Paul says to the, the church in Corinth, like, you guys stepped up and you did it. You did the hard thing. But then you guys got tripped up after it worked. And so in verses 10 and 11, Paul affirmed, like his intention, his heart was to forgive the man. So he wasn't going to wait on the Corinthians to forgive him before he forgave him. He simply stated that as the Corinthians treated this man with mercy, that they could be assured and rest assured that he was gonna do the same thing too. And so Paul told them he forgave the man for essentially three reasons. Number one, the man repented. He changed, he turned from his sin. Uh, number two, he said, I'm gonna do this, verse 10, for your benefit, for the benefit of the church, benefit of Christ. So. You could tell he's kind of signaling to them, here's a struggle that you all have in the church. And a lot of churches struggle with this. He wanted the church to learn how to be a gracious, merciful, and forgiving church. He wanted the church to learn how to restore people back into the fellowship properly. And then number three, he said, the third reason that he said we need to forgive this guy is so that Satan might not outwit him. Look at verse 11. So that we would not be outwitted by Satan. For we're not ignorant of his designs, literally schemes, schematas, Satan's strategies. So Satan has a scheme or a strategy that he tries to take people down with, and it's different for every single person. 
But Paul was smart, like Paul was, Paul was savvy, and he knew, and I want you to hear this, he knew Satan would try and seize on the mistake of the mismanaged discipline process in the church to discourage the repentant man while also creating a bunch of judgy Christians in Corinth too. Like he knew that Satan was going to try and capitalize on the mistakes and missteps of the church to divide the church, to hurt the church, to hurt people, and to destroy the reputation of the church in the community. Which is why Paul said, hey, listen, 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 listen. Church discipline worked. This guy repented. It's what we wanted. Don't forget. So let's love this guy. Let's restore this guy so we don't get played by Satan. So Satan doesn't like set us all up for a crash and a burn. So one commentator summed it up like this. And I think this is a really, really helpful analysis. Listen to what he says. The tendency of human nature is to hold the offender at arm's length, to, to forgive but not to forget, to say, I receive you back, but to treat the person like a leper. Discipline can be inflexible so as to leave no place for repentance and reconciliation. At that point, it has ceased to be truly Christian. For it is no less a scandal to cut off the repentant sinner from all hope of a re-entry into the comfort and security and fellowship of the church than it is to permit flagrant wickedness to continue unpunished in the body of Christ. Let me translate that, all right? Essentially what it means is this, and I think this is what Paul is saying to us. He's saying to us that we can, on the one hand, we can sin by being too soft on sin. And we don't want to do that. Or we can sin by being too hard on the person who's fallen into sin. And so he's kind of calling us here to step back and kind of like, how do you thread the needle here where you're not soft on sin, where you're just like squishy and you don't care about holiness or purity within the church and you just let people do whatever they want to do. There's, there's that. And then how do, we, how do we then respond to people who fall into sin in a way that we're not sinning against the people who are now trying to re-enter back into the fellowship and community of the church? Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, okay, okay. And so the big question then is like, so, so what, do we, what do we do with all this? What is God saying to us today? Well, I, I see actually... Three, three big takeaways for us, okay? Number one, the first one is this. I, I, I see that there is a danger, I mean danger, in believing you are above certain sins and above the people who commit those sins. All throughout the Bible, we are warned, do not take sin lightly. Sin is crouching at your door. Think about that image, by the way. That sin is crouching and hiding at your front door. You don't see it when you open the door, but it's waiting for you to do what? To pounce on you. That's what sin does. It is crouching at your door, ready to pounce on you. The Bible would say you're not above, I'm not above falling into any sin uh, the Bible would encourage us, don't ever say, I'd never do that. How many of you have fallen prey to that one? I'd never do that. And then two days later, you just did that. Like we all fall prey to that. The Bible says pride comes before the fall. Take heed lest you fall. The Bible is really, really interesting, actually. The Bible tells us to be, to be physical when we deal with sin. Run, flee, turn, like don't flirt with it. And certainly don't be cocky around it. Yeah, yeah, I don't worry about that. Don't, don't fall prey to being arrogant when it comes to sin. 
As well, I would say this, over time, over time, I think it's really, really easy to start feeling superior to the people who've fallen into sin. Can you, can you, can you believe? Can you believe he said that? Can you believe she did that? Can you believe it? And, and we start to feel really smug, baby, and superior to people who've fallen into sin. And here's how you know, I'm just gonna tell you, here's how you know something's really off inside of you. You know something's really off when instead of feeling badly for the person who's fallen into sin, you now feel like you are better than the person who has fallen into sin. And I, I see that like that strand of Phariseeism creep into people's hearts in a really insidious way where we begin to look down our nose at other people who've fallen into sin. And, and rather than like hurting for them, we're just kind of glad we're not them. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm being real, y'all, not, are, you, are you like, right? And so I, I would say this, the comparison trap is a terrible game to play. And let me tell you why the comparison trap is a terrible game to play. I know how to play it. And every time I play it, I guarantee I'm going to win. Cause I'm not gonna compare myself to anybody who's smarter than me, more handsome than me, faster than me, but all, I'm gonna pick people who are beneath me. And then I'm gonna do what? I'm gonna elevate myself while looking down my nose at you. And so the comparison trap is a terrible game to play. Like they did that, I would never do that. Listen, you could fall into any sin just like I could. We all are susceptible to sin. And so the comparison game is a terrible trap. It ends up holding you hostage and it makes you competitive and not compassionate. So you have to start checking your heart. Like, is there, is there a compassion in me for people who've fallen into sin? Or is there a, thank God I'm not like them. Wow, can you believe that? Can you believe they did that? Whenever that starts to emerge in your heart, you know your heart is really, really off. And so please remember that none of us are beyond. None of us are beyond any sin and none of us are above any sinner. It's why Jonathan Edwards wrote, and I thought this is brilliant, this makes perfect sense here. This is what he said. The best protection one can have from the devil and his schemes is a humble heart. It's a humble heart. And so we need like massive doses of, of humility to fight the feelings of superiority that we have over sin and over people who sin. Number two, there is a, there is a danger when you start becoming less loving, less gracious, less kind, less forgiving as people struggle. We're not told why the Corinthians wouldn't forgive, wouldn't restore. We're not told why they wanted to keep this guy in the penalty box. We, we don't know, but this is a warning sign to us that their hearts weren't right with God. And so I would say this, all throughout your Christian journey, all throughout right, your following of Jesus Christ, your life should be progressing in the areas of love and grace and mercy and forgiveness. Our hearts should be growing increasingly tender and sensitive, not bitter and vindictive. And I'm just convinced, I'm convinced that when you understand both like the depravity of humanity, like just how depraved humanity is, and you understand the goodness of the gospel, you will, you will hug, you will embrace, you will memorize, you will internalize Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. You'll do this. I'm gonna let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from me along with all malice. And here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be kind to the other person. I'm gonna be tenderhearted, forgiving one another. I'm gonna forgive people as God and Christ forgave me. 
And so I would say this, when your Christianity is right and tight, you will be an amazing person to be around. You'll be an amazing person to be around. Everyone will want to be around you. Why? Because you're kind and you're tender and you're merciful and you're forgiving. You won't be someone that no one wants to be around. Bitter, wrathful, angry, unforgiving. So one of the ways you can check yourself is like, does anybody like you? <laughs> it's kind of harsh, isn't it? Does anybody like you? In the church, outside the church, are people drawn to you? It's amazing to me. You study the life of Jesus. It's fascinating to me. He was never soft on sin. And who always wanted to hang around him? Sinners. Why? He had the perfect balance. I'm not squishy on sin, but I'm not here to crush you either. And he had no sin. If anyone could have dealt with feelings of superiority, it would have been the guy who invented the whole thing, right? It would have been him. And yet people were drawn to him. You know who didn't like Jesus? Self-righteous religious people. That's exactly right. They're the ones that didn't like Jesus. Sinners were drawn to him. And so what happened? The religious people would accuse Jesus of being a sinner himself because they play the comparison game. And so listen, when your Christianity is right, you'll be an amazing person. You won't be someone no one wants to be around. Thirdly, what is God saying to us today? I think he's saying to us today that there is a danger in getting outwitted by Satan. So Satan tries to outwit us by getting us, as an example, to hold on to unhealthy emotions. So whenever we hold on to our bitterness, whenever we hold on to our jealousy, our offense, uh, our unforgiveness, our depraved thinking, we fall right into Satan's trap, hurting ourselves in the process. Another way, another way that Satan outwits us is through the elitist thinking that we just talked about. So, so I think every, every time we gather together as God's people, like, like the enemy is always trying to, to confuse and to stir and, and divide. And, and so Satan is always like, like cozying up next to you during the message and, and whispering in your ear while I'm up here talking to you. He's whispering, yeah, like, like, thank God, thank God. You're not like your family and friends. They're awful. You, you're amazing. Like, God's lucky to have you on his team. Do you think God knows just how lucky he is to have somebody like you on his team? And when you, listen, when you believe the hype, it makes you ripe, and I'm working it today. When you, like, like when you believe the hype, it makes you ripe for a crash and burn. That's what it does. Another way that Satan outwits us is by making us think that we are, we are the exception. We're the exception. So, so you hear the message like it's a great message for these people, for these people, for, for them. Uh, it's like this, sounds like this. Sure, sure, like a, I'll concede that everyone needs to watch out for sin. Uh, but Satan's always saying, but not, but not you. Like, like, you're in control. You don't struggle like these people. You don't struggle like these people. Or it's like, sure, everyone needs to be quick to forgive, but not you. No one's gone through what you have. Your, your, your experience is so unique to the world. God will understand your bitterness. Sure, everyone needs to get in the word, but not you. You're the busiest person in the world. You're the most important person ever. And your schedule, no one has a schedule like you. God will understand, or it's sure. Everyone needs to humble themselves under the mighty hand of God, but not you. You're already uniquely humble. Tell everybody how humble you are. 
take a selfie right now and, and, and post it. Show the world what a truly humble man looks like. Hashtag rocking my humility. Yeah, yeah, I know. No, I know. Oh, sure, everyone needs to be a part of, of a church community for accountability, but not you. You don't want to be a part of it, right? You, you do a great job holding yourself accountable. And Christians, they just get up in your business anyway. To which I would say, whenever you think you are elite, beyond sin, better than those who have sinned, whenever you think that you are the exception to the rule, you have got outwitted by Satan. You've been outwitted. You've, you've gotten schemed. And so we need to be humble. We need to be quick to forgive. We need to be gracious to those who've fallen into sin so that we can be aware of Satan's schemes so that we don't hurt other people and we don't dishonor the name and person and church of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So we gotta thread, we gotta, you gotta thread that needle. We're not gonna be soft on sin, but we're gonna be so hard on people who have sinned and repented that we're like, we're killing them because we won't restore them or forgive them. So listen, if you have, if you have sinned against someone today, let me just say this. No one's looking for a flippant, disingenuous, sorry, are we good? That's not repentance. So if you have sinned against someone, repent. That means you change. Change the way you think. Change the way you live. Change the way you move. It means that you have a real passion to repair what you've broken. Fix it. Quit blaming everybody. Fix it. Repent. That's genuine repentance. Humble yourself. Let me tell you why people don't repent. They won't humble themselves. Hard. It's hard to go, yep, here's what I've done. I'm going to own it. Hard to do that. But I'm going to encourage you, man. Do it today. Because I'm going to tell you something about humility. If you don't humble yourself, so you got an option here. If you don't humble yourself, God will humble you. And I don't know about you, but I'm choosing to humble myself. I'd rather do it myself than have God do it to me. You know what I mean? I, I'll humble myself. I want to be humble. Uh, I would say this. If you're here today and you're holding on to unforgiveness, you need to let it go. When you let it go, it doesn't make the offense all right. It makes you all right. I've shared these quotes with you before. Unforgiveness is like drinking rat poison and hoping the rat dies. It's like setting yourself on fire and hoping the smoke bothers somebody else. Like all unforgiveness does is hurt you. It just, it just hurts you and, and keeps you hostage to these toxic emotions that God's trying to set you free from. So you just hurt yourself. Uh, I would say this, if you've noticed in you this judginess starting to emerge, you need to check it. You need to check it right now. Because that, that, that superiority complex, man, that can just take over and it can really hurt people. And it hurts you too. I would say this, if you, you've started to try and do the Christian life without Jesus, you need to Come on back to Jesus. One of the ways that you know you're, you're really following Jesus and your Christianity is healthy is that you have a real compassion for people. You, you start loving people more, not loving them less. You start having more mercy and more grace, not less mercy and less grace. So come on back to Jesus. No way to be a follower of Jesus Christ without looking like the person of, of Jesus Christ. Then finally, I would say this. If you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, what are you waiting on? Like, why wouldn't you turn from your sin, say yes to the person of Jesus Christ? Man, he will, he will forgive all of your sins. He will fill your life with purpose and meaning and power. 
Well, he'll give you a future that is beyond this world. So listen, I want to encourage you. Say yes to Jesus. Turn from your sin. Run to the Savior whose name is Jesus. Amen? Amen and amen. 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 Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's true. And I pray you would help us today that if we have sinned against someone that we would genuinely repent if we're holding on to unforgiveness today, that you would help us to let it go. God, I, I pray that if those of us here today, if we've noticed the judginess in us creeping into the way that we think of others, Lord, I pray that you would eradicate it even now. Lord, help us to, to know that the whole Christian life is about following Jesus, not being religious. So help us to do life with Jesus. Help us to come back to Jesus. And Lord, do not let us, please do not let us get outwitted by Satan. Help us to be aware of his schemes. And Lord, I pray for those today who've never trusted you. I pray they would trust you today. That they would bow the knee and say yes to Christ today. So Lord, do your work in us now. And I pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Grateful for the word. Let's stand together. It's all about Christ. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say
Amen. You can be seated. Well, we feel and we believe and we know that we as a church are called to uh, make disciples of Jesus Christ across the street and around the world. And, and in order for that to happen, uh, we need our church family to come alongside us. And so that is why your giving is so important. And so we're gonna continue this morning in worship through giving. But if you're wondering like, Matt, what does it actually go to? Well, we had a team just recently go down to Nairobi, Kenya, and they had some incredible ministry impact there. And we actually wanna show you a little bit of what that is. So check out this video. Yeah, amen. What an incredible example. What an incredible example. Uh, just to say your giving actually really, really matters. And so if you've come prepared this morning to worship in that way, there are three different ways you can do it. The first, many giving stations throughout the building. The second, the Grace Church app. If you haven't downloaded that yet, download it. Uh, and the third is just grace.church slash give, uh, especially for those that are worshiping online, if you want to join us in giving this morning too. And there are other ways that you can get connected into all that Grace Church is doing uh, in our community across the street and around the global world. And if you're interested in getting connected, you can go to grace.church slash connect. Uh, and maybe you're like, Matt, I have such a niche, 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 niche interest I, I like what in the world can I do? Well, maybe you're like, I love bells and I wanna be part of a bell choir. Do you have a bell choir? We do have a bell choir and you should join it. I've been considering, I haven't been, but maybe I will, you never know. 
grace.church slash connect, many different ways that you can get connected. And also if you uh, are in need of resourcing today, maybe you need prayer, maybe uh, you have questions or, or maybe you're new to the faith and you just wanna be like, almost be told what to do next. We would love to see you at our prayer resource center to my right, to your left. And before we go, uh, Pastor Troy is actually gonna come back up because he's got something he wants to share with us. So, thank you. You know, this, uh, this past week, I got an email from a family who's been attending Grace for about three years now. Uh, Peter and Amy Goshgarian, and they have eight children, nine children. And their eight-year-old daughter, Lauren, passed away this week. Just, just tragic, painful, heartfelt, tragic. And I know as the body of Christ, I know that you care. And so they're here today. And if Peter and Amy, if you and your children would stand, I don't see where you guys are. If you guys would stand so we could see you. You see them? There they are. You see them up at the top? Church, I want you to stand if you would. We get everybody to stand. I want you to turn. And you guys wave your hands so we can all see you. That's the family right there. And so if you would, church, let's extend a hand towards this family. And I'm gonna take just a moment and let you pray. Cry out on their behalf. Pray for them. And, and I want you, man, ask God to show up in a powerful way. I can't imagine all they're going through, the grief, the pain, but they know Jesus, they love Jesus, they follow Jesus, and they're committed to the person of Jesus Christ. I can tell you that beyond a shadow of a doubt. But to the entire Gosh Garian family, we want you to know that we support you and we love you and we are here for you guys. And we want you to feel our comfort and compassion and love today. So church, let's pray for them right now. You just take a moment and pray. God, I, I pray that you would overwhelm the Goshgarian family. Just overwhelm them with peace and grace and mercy and love and tenderness and kindness. That they would feel deeply supported and cared for amongst their brothers and sisters. I pray that they would fight against the lie of the enemy that they have to walk this journey alone but they would see, they would see today that we are here too. The body of Christ coming around this beautiful family. And so Lord Jesus, we give you glory, we give you honor, we give you victory, that you're the one who's defeated death once and for all, and that Lauren is alive forevermore. And so Lord, we bless you, and we wanna bless the Goshgarian family now, and we do it as a church family, and all of God's people said, amen and amen and amen. We love you guys. We love you guys. Thank you for praying and you are, you are dismissed.